Birmingham, the second city. Who are you calling second? Home to more than a million. Part of the manufacturing Midlands. The canal capital of the UK. And now host to the Commonwealth Games. But how did Birmingham go from the centre of the Industrial Revolution to being the first ever minority majority city in the UK? How did it go from Algar to Scar? How did the city become one of the hubs of Commonwealth communities in the UK and one of the most religiously diverse cities in the world? How did Birmingham become a Commonwealth city? I'm Mark Lewis Francis, Commonwealth Games gold medalist and a proud Brummie. This city means so much to me. It's where I was born, where I grew up, and where it all started for me on the trek. My mum gave me that start. She was my first interpretation of what hard work is. She moved over from Jamaica with nothing and ended up getting a good education and a good job. Over the years, Birmingham has been reshaped by migrants just like her. And now it is a melting pot of people from different cultures, religions, race and backgrounds. I want to meet just some of those people. People who, like me, call this city home, but whose history and heritage reaches far wider, from the Windrush generation to the hometown heroes of today. I want to learn about the challenges they've faced, the changes they've witnessed, and above all, the pride they feel in calling themselves a Brummie. So, I'm journeying around Birmingham to meet those who have researched it and those who have lived it to find out how the city I call home came to be. I'm Professor Carl Jean MBE and I'm a social historian. There are tantalising hints of people from the West Indies and India in Birmingham in the 19th century. But it's really in the 1930s a few students and doctors from India settled in Birmingham. Amongst the early South Asian migrants to Birmingham were men who had been Lascars. These were merchant seamen playing a vital role in bringing goods to Britain during the Second World War. There were men from what is now Attock who had been involved with the British Army in India. The RAF recruited very heavily in the West Indies for men to be pilots and involved in the flying of aircraft. After the war, the vast majority went back, but these are young men. And as one of them later said to me, I was a young man, I missed the excitement. And so he came back. These men were the pioneers, the roots of the movement of Commonwealth people to Birmingham lie with men who have been prepared to fight and die for this country. I'm here to visit one of those men who came to Britain to fight for it, to discuss his extraordinary story. My name is Albert Samuel Jarrett, born 1924. I'm Shirley Jarrett. I'm Albert's wife. I've grown up in Jamaica until I was 17 years old when I joined the Royal Air Force and then came to England as an airman. Um, I had a very, very good job in Jamaica. So I took the job and I worked for five years. And then this great repatriation of people from the, the, the Commonwealth and the West Indies coming to England. Everyone going back to England, everyone is going, soon they didn't have no friends. Everyone is going to England. So there was, I had no other choice but to go back to England. My name's uh, Jaguan Johal. I used to work in local government, primarily in race and equalities and then ended up um, being a chief officer at Birmingham City Council. It was the 1948 Nationality Act which gave Commonwealth citizens free right of entry to the UK. In the early years of the migration of people to Birmingham from the Commonwealth it was mostly men and they were settling in really bad quality housing. Life was difficult, it was hard. Not only did they face problems with getting good jobs and facing discrimination, their living accommodation was overcrowded. Initially the push factor was that we could go over, earn some money and actually return. So in the early days, uh, a lot of the money that was earned actually 
was sent back. The other push-pull factor, particularly for Birmingham, was the metal bashing uh, industries, the foundries. It's like my father came over here in 58, and within a week of being here, he ended up in the foundry, yeah. He had initially come to study at uh, the LSC, but because he actually got into the sort of foundry and he could read and write, and he helped sort of set up the union, and when it was time for him to go, you know, the worker says, says hang on a minute, uh, you've set up the union and now you're leaving. So he was persuaded to sort of stay. They had a shared accommodation in Oxford Road. They uh, had uh, a rough time, but they also had a good time in terms of their camaraderie, their sort of kinship. I had decided to come back to England in 1953. This is a different country from 1953. I'm gonna tell you something now. When I came back here, people was behind the curtain, I put it a look. If you walk in on the street, they look like we see you as if they have never seen you before. I couldn't believe that. Why do you think that was? What you call discrimination or what it is. It was in them, but during the war, they couldn't have shown because they, they needed help and they needed service. After the war, it's all over. Whenever we look at migration, we have to understand there are push and pull factors, economic difficulties in the West Indies as a result of being part of the British Empire. In Azad Kashmir, the Mangla Dam was built. A lot of land was flooded and the idea was that then some of the people that lost their homes would be able to get jobs in Britain. So there's, there's the push, but there's also the pull of moving to a new place, a big city, and Birmingham was booming in the 1950s. It was a city of a thousand trades. I was so happy when I came here okay. because I've been hearing about England, England, mm. you know? And you come here, I said, wonder if I'm gonna get all those opportunities that I'm hearing about. Mm -hmm. You could go anywhere and get a job, them days. There was a job center right by the old fire station. And then I went in there and they gave me six cards. He said, go to any of these. A week later, I went and joined the bus company. And I became a driver. And the, the inspector in charge at once, his name was Mr. Ford. He would do anything for me to get the inspector. At the time, this country was so racially bad, they wouldn't have a black inspector around the bus. So I packed the job up and I went and I drove the ambulance. We were recognized, don't forget. But today, we are recognized. I want to tell you something that you will not be able to see and to talk about the past because you haven't seen it, you're too young. Let me tell you that. But I can. And uh, I am so, I'm so happy for what life is like today. Look how I have, I have good white friend here, that best friend. You understand me? Once upon a time, that couldn't happen. And I tell you, coming back to England, I made great gain. Maybe not for myself alone, but for my family. The growth my family had in education. They had that standard of growth in education. I'm so glad. And I have a set of grandchildren, and everyone our university graduate. Amazing. To my grandchildren, how glad did I did come here. How proud of Birmingham are you? It's marvelous if you, when I think of it. The changes that I have seen here, today we can say to each other, we are all one, black and white. So I am very, very proud of Birmingham. And I'm quite proud for what I have done.